Good evening, this is the Oscar Expert here with Brother Bro. Good evening, this is Matt Negley here with the Oscar Expert and Brother Bro. If you don't know, Matt Neglia is the founder and main honcho behind Next Best Picture. He's got the Next Best Picture website and the Next Best Picture podcast, where he has on all kinds of Oscar contenders, um, amazing guests like Delroy Lindo, Emerald Fennell. So if you are a fan of our stuff and you don't already know Matt and you don't already know Best Picture, you've got to you got to give him a follow on Twitter. You got to check out that podcast. It's great stuff. So thanks so much for being here, Matt. We're really excited to finally meet you. I'm so excited to finally meet you two. You guys might be a big fan of me, but I want you to know that I've been a big fan of both of you for a long time now, and I absolutely love your stuff, and I'm just so, so, so pumped to be here. I have a lot of questions for you. Like, I, I've kind of had it in my, in my mind that, okay, one day I'm probably going to meet Matt, and so I, I kind of know, like, there's some things I'm just really curious about, like, what made you start Next Best Picture and how and where did it what were the beginnings like what kind of humble beginnings are you coming from here? I don't know how humble they were, but I mean, so necessarily uh, I was kind of just sitting around in my mid 20s with nothing to really do. My life was kind of directionless and I loved movies and I like a lot of people listen to podcasts with Clayton Davis over at Awards Circuit. Back then it was called Oscar Igloo. Uh, Sasha Stone at Awards <laughs> Daily, Chris Tapley at In Contention, and he would have Ann Thompson on. And I would listen to these shows and I'd be like, oh, I'm naive enough to think I could do that because I was very, very passionate about it. And I knew that I had this thing that I really liked that not everyone else in my life was really that interested in. So I knew it was unique. And so I just one day, I don't know what came over me. I just decided, you know what? I'm going to do this. And my roommate at the time looked at me and he says to me, do you know how to build a website? I was like, no. Do you know how to make a podcast? No. And he's like, do you know what the hell you're doing? I was like, no, but that's part of the fun, you know, and we'll figure it out as we go along. And it's kind of just snowballed into this giant, <laughs> giant thing that like, honestly, it's exceeded my expectations. Yeah, and how much of this, how much of your life is Next Specs picture? And then how much is like just anything else that you got to do on a daily basis? Like, is this a full time thing now or is it? No. So, I mean, like, I still have a nine to six day job that I still have to do on top of everything. Wow. Uh, but. But honestly, when I'm not doing that, Next Best Picture is literally what I eat, live and breathe 24 seven. I think about it constantly every day. I haven't taken an off day or a vacation and like going on six years now at this point. Uh, so for me, it's just nonstop, constantly all the time. Just go, 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 go. Yeah. Everybody on Twitter who's like associated with Me Next Best Picture is like, Matt is like the busiest guy. Like he's always working. So I'm also curious about like the whole next next best picture team and like you know when when you kind of decided that you needed to like assemble this crew and like I'm also curious like how do you how do you pick this crew and what is this whole team environment I guess. When I first started it was just me with a website like everybody else where it's just you and you alone and you know you start thinking oh am I going to be a freelancer and then you got like a little little blog and everything. And then I quickly realized uh, that I needed to bring on permanent people. So I reached out to some folks who on Twitter looked like they enjoyed the Oscars. And that was kind of it. It was like, oh, I hope I like these people. I set up a call and <laughs> got a chance to like talk to them for a little bit. And it, it kind of from there has been very similar where you scope people out through um, other podcasts or you just looking on Twitter at who seems like they're really into awards. Um, nowadays, I know a lot of people uh, check people out on Letterboxd, you know, and they read their Letterbox reviews, which is a great way to uh, search for new talent. But now I'm very fortunate enough that people are reaching out to me and they want to be a part of Next Best Picture. So I don't have to necessarily uh, go out looking a lot at a time. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the time we have to say no to people, which sucks uh, because you can't have the team get so, so big necessarily. Uh, but you know, we still let people contribute to the site whenever they can and however they can. So that this way we can kind of create a nice bench, if you will, of talent. So if a day comes where a spot does open, we know people from their previous contributions to the site of a writings that they've done that they would be a good fit at some point. What's been the most challenging part? Because I know from for me, I also wanted to create a website and I had this idea like almost two years ago, I think. 
And so my approach was like, I, I was like, okay, I have to learn web development. And I actually started to learn coding because I wanted to do like a little more than a web blog. But it's it's a huge task to like manage and run a website. Like how daunting was that? And like, when did you kind of get the hang of it? So in the very beginning, like I said before, I had no idea what I was doing. And so as a result of which, it was kind of like trial by error. It was like, all right, let me play around with WordPress. Let me play around with Squarespace. Let me play around with Weebly. Let me play around with all of these different website applications. And let me see which one just works best. And I had to take it piece by piece, very, very slowly. I actually want to give a shout out to a friend of mine. His name is JD Duran over at in Session Film because he was someone that very early on kind of helped me when he had absolutely no reason to want to help me. Um, I was a nobody back then. And he actually helped me a lot with understanding how to build a podcast, how to build the website, and really just kind of being a very good early mentor in a way. So I would say like, that's another thing too, is like, I always tell people, don't be afraid to ask for help. I get DMs all the time from people asking me like little things here and there. You know, I can't answer these broad general questions about like, oh, how do we get like, you know, semi successful like you are like, come on, you know, it's like, I don't know. That's like a lot of it is luck in a lot of ways, you know, but at the same time, if you want to ask me something specific, um, I'm more than happy to answer that same as people were happy to answer it for me. Like the idea that you kind of just came up with this idea and here you are with like a podcast and a website where you're posting every day with like a bunch of editors. When you really think about it, it's like there's one person behind the curtain, like who has to learn all this stuff to yep. do it. So I definitely look up, I mean, I look up the best picture in that way because I'm kind of trying to imagine like where we could take this. It's not just a YouTube mm -hmm. thing. And he's really managing, like he does all the YouTube stuff. And I'm kind of like, I, I think there, I, I want to do something with a website. Like I want to do an, a, a predictions application. And um, I also want to make like a, an interface for people to interact with like Oscar data. Because I find myself like if I'm trying to look up data, I have to open a bunch of tabs like to go on each Wikipedia page. I don't know if you ever do this where it's like, oh, I wonder yes. who won Best Actress like this year, this year. Or how did it, how was it at Critics' Choice? How was it at Golden Globes in 2006? And so I want to create a, a website where people can ease, like all the data is on a database somewhere and you're just interacting with it. And it makes it easy for you to like, just kind of come up with stuff. So fun yeah. fact, uh, we actually tried making that once and it was a logistical oh God, really? nightmare trying to just get all the data together. <laughs> I mean, that is a very, very big project. Yeah. But let me tell you, some someday project, someone's yeah. going to make it and it's going to make all of our lives so much easier because I, 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 I'm he's, with you. He's I, a, I like I, I have yeah. to memorize it. You know, because I'm like, I can't spend the time right. looking it up. I just need to <laughs> right. try my best to memorize these lineups and who won, who was nominated, you know? He's yeah. now like practically a professional coder because he went through like a boot camp. He kind of went out of the, this job. That I did he had, a lot like, of, yeah. Yeah. So he actually, I think, I think oh, he right. knows he's actually going to be the guy to do it. Yeah. He I know that a data I, mine I Wikipedia. Is that, that's what no, you call I, it, right? I, I, I know you can do it. I don't know how to, well, and also you could just manually enter all the data if you couldn't do that. But I do have hope that let, I'm going to get it out there one day because, um, I learned, I learned software engineering. Like I learned how to actually like, work with data and not just do like WordPress stuff. So, I mean, I, I learned it to transition my career also. So it was kind of like a double, you know, two birds, one stone, like move my career over to something like that and then try to like build something cool. So it takes forever though. It's it's like, I had the idea for that years ago. I thought I was going to get it done in like a few months and then here I am and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't even know how close I am. I could be like a fifth of the way there. I mean, the I biggest know. thing it's that I'll tell you in regards like... to that is if you love it and you really want to get it done, you will find a way. And like, that's how it kind of was yeah. with the podcast and the website. It's like, if you really, really love it and you are truly, like I said before, eat, living and breathing this 24 seven, you can't help but find a way because there's going to be something in you that's going to constantly be pushing you to get there. Even if you're like, I don't know, I don't know, but there's going to be that thing that's pushing you like, no, go, 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 go. Like he just exactly yeah. <laughs> don't, don't think about it. Just go, you know, and you'll figure it out. You have like the force on your side, like the force, you know, the forces in the universe, like just they found you and they were like, this guy likes to push himself and he's just going to make an awards blog for everybody to like go nuts over. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm um, telling you, dude, if you make that database, I'll that be I'll be there on, on there every day. I promise you. Anyway, for the podcast, like you interview everybody, which is awesome. Like, what's your experience just talking to 
all different kinds of people. Like you talk to cinematographers or, or music or composers and actors and directors like you. And I think I think you you uh, come across like very professional, like, you know, kind of the right questions to ask. How was it working up to like interviewing with these Oscar winners and nominees. Yeah, because that's like a whole nother role as like an interviewer. Right, yeah. yeah, it definitely is. And there's two components to it. One is definitely listening to how other people have done it before and just trying to find something for yourself that's comfortable within that. So, you know, if I was interviewing you guys, it's kind of like what you're just doing with me right now. It's no different than talking to someone that, you know, is a big name and, you know, you're like, you know, you might be a little intimidated because you're building them up in your mind. But that was like the second piece of advice that somebody gave me that was so important, which was they're just people. And if you talk to them like they're people, like conversationally, and don't try to overthink it, it'll just come naturally. I remember the first time I did my first ever in-person interview, which wasn't done over the phone. So I, I didn't have my questions in front of me. And I was so scared because I was thinking to myself like, oh my God, what if I stumble and I make a fool of myself and so on and so forth. But then all of a sudden you realize that if you just take it slow and keep it very conversational, the passion for what it is that you do and the passion for what you love and so on and so forth, that will just inevitably come through. You you can, and it doesn't even have to be film that you could talk about. You could talk about other things all of a sudden, you know, and it, it's, it's very, very interesting in that regard. I've had interviews, uh, off air before where we were talking and <laughs> next thing you know, we start talking about something completely random that has nothing to do with the movie has nothing to do with their role or whatever it is, you know, and it, it just sort of happens. And I think that comes from just how good are you with talking to people in general? So do you consider yourself good at talking to people or have you always, <laughs> oh, man, I got to get the gap. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> I was blessed. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, Oh, that's the easy part for you. Yeah, honestly, it really is. Uh, talking to people is very easy for me. I, I've worked in sales uh, pretty much almost my entire life, so I talk, you know, a mile yeah, a minute a lot of times. Yeah, i that, right? Sales is something that um, if you ask me, like, what career could you not do, like, ever? Would you that I'd just be bad at? Like, I would say it's sales. I couldn't, I couldn't sell you like anything, probably <laughs> just just based on like my personality. Um, I'm curious from someone who who does it for a living. Like, do you enjoy that? Um, I, <laughs> I enjoy it when it's going well. <laughs> um, when it's not going well, okay. it absolutely sucks because then it becomes really, really high anxiety, <laughs> high pressure. For me, I think sales works if you really believe in the product that you're selling. Like, if you really think it's going to make the person's life better, that makes it easier. If you don't believe in the product that you're selling to people, then and it's kind of like how I would talk about, you know, the website and the podcast to people. I would talk about how, hey, listen, we're trying to do something a little bit different. We're trying to make this uh, very um, community focused awards like website that has like a feeling of fun, but also mixed with seriousness, you know, and we're not going to be too far leaning one way or the other way in terms of being uh, goofy, but also, you know, not being so dead serious that we're like dry and boring uh, and it's it's interesting because like I found that like life is like sales. You're constantly putting yourself out there all the time to people. You're constantly having to sell yourself. And so in a way, if you've ever achieved any kind of success in life, it might be because you do have a little bit of sales in you. Uh, it also could just be that you're a very good person <laughs> and people gravitate towards good, good people. <laughs> I definitely relate with that. I'm applying to jobs right now. So there's a lot of selling oh, going yes. on. And I haven't had to talk to strangers in a while <laughs> because of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, just avoid, can avoid that. So there's that. The last um, time I talked to strangers, I think, was like Sundance last year. Wait, like, what are you talking about? What you, like, you've been talking strangers. to a stranger? Strang like who? Like, I don't know. Exactly. Like like people at the counter of a, of like a place. Yeah, Actually, didn't you like, meet um, one of my writers at Sundance, uh, Casey Lee Clark? Yeah, yeah, I, I remember the talking to The last stranger yeah. he ever talked to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I guess. <laughs> Becoming the salesman is is something that like I've thought about needing to improve with me because like I'm like my origins are being the quiet kid in class a lot of the time. And so like I want to do that more, but like I've been I've been like comfortably not able to do it in a way. Mm. 
Yeah, see, I was a class an clown. I was a, <laughs> I was a fool. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And yeah. then I, I have another question, um, a, a very burning question. You watched how many movies at Sundance? 50... 56. Oh my something, God. right? I think it was okay. 56, question 57, is... 58, something like that. <laughs> the question is how? <laughs> That's um, it. So remember uh, before when you were saying that people say, oh, Matt's like a cyborg, like Matt doesn't sleep. Matt it basically is, is not human. Um, it, <laughs> okay, it really so essentially true. what would happen is I would wake up every morning at like, like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., whatever it was, and then I would just start watching movies right away. I would get my coffee and I would just start. Um, I would then just go the whole day, literally until whatever the midnight screening was, and that was the last screening of the day. Go to sleep, get four hours, wake up, do it all over again, you know? What, well, how do you feel about watching movies like in that succession? Because... When I was doing it, like I watched half the movies you did and I was like pretty exhausted from just that. Like, are you cool with just absorbing six movies and that's your day? Yeah, I take very vigorous notes when I do it. So for me, it's like if something gets lost, I know that I'll be able to refer to my notes later. It always helps if I can rewatch, obviously, like before we hop on a podcast review. In fact, every time we do a podcast review during quarantine, I've actually gotten into the habit of uh, we record on Saturdays, our main reviews at 11 a.m. I'll wake up at 8 a.m. and I'll watch the movie just a few hours right before we begin. So this way, it's just super, super fresh and I'll still have my notes anyway. Uh, but, you know, there were times where, yeah, when you're watching that many movies, you got to take you got to take notes, especially if you're going to write reviews on any of them or podcasts about them later. And I know that not everyone can do that. Listen, here's the other thing, too. I think people sometimes kind of overhype it a little like, oh, I saw this many movies and stuff. And they think it's like some sort of like superpower or something like that. <laughs> um, it's not for everyone. And that's OK. That's OK if, you know, if you want to watch like 17 movies, 20 movies, and, you know, that was your experience. You went at your own pace and that's totally fine. You know, me, I'm. I'm I'll admit I'm fucking crazy. I prefer <laughs> being anxiety driven all the time. I prefer being stressed and I like having my back up against the wall. Like, am I going to make it? Am I going to be able to do this? And it's the way that I'm able to get shit done is when I feel like I have no other choice. So if I were mm -hmm. being very leisurely about it and kind of going at it at my own pace and everything, that would just feel so unnatural to me because like that's just not often how I operate. <laughs> Yeah, what kind of notes do you take when you watch a movie, by the way? Like, what do you think is important to get down? Is it is it like your own thoughts or you're like kind of making observations or like writing down quotes? I have two sections always. One is about plot and the other is about uh, just random thoughts about what I think. So for plot, it could be, you know, something that a character says. Um, it could be... Uh, just an interesting development that happens where you're like, oh, I don't know if that's going to pay off later. Let me make a note of it really quick. You know what I mean? Um, it could be about just simply what the story is about and what is happening. And then it's funny because the two then sometimes might intersect a little bit because you're describing the plot and then you start getting into, OK, well, this didn't follow like your traditional three act structure or something like that, you know, and. I don't know. There are a lot of different ways that I go about it, but it helps me sometimes too with writing the review because I just structure my reviews very simply as intro paragraph, um, plot synopsis, a couple paragraphs on my thoughts, and then my closing paragraph. So it's very, very easy for me from an organizational standpoint to then be like, all right, I have mm -hmm. my uh, plot uh, notes and then I have my thoughts notes and I'm able to just then, you know, kind of put it all together. Is writing something that you ever like were trained in or like had classes in or you you just like kind of naturally learned how to like get your thoughts on the page? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I I mean, listen, you know, it's like I went to school and I wrote and I got grades and things like that. But yeah. no, I didn't take classes for writing. And that was uh, honestly something that was like a very, very big learning curve for me when, you know, I first started. And it's still something that um, I tell my team all the time, like, I don't think I'm good. Um, my team tells me they think I'm pretty all right, but I don't think I'm great. I think they're amazing. And I read some of the writing that people like out there that get paid professionally to do this for a living. Like I read their stuff and I'm like just mesmerized by how talented they are. I can't do that. What I do 
take a lot of pride in and what I do feel very confident about is how I conduct the podcast, how I run the podcast, and also just how much I've tried to perfect it, you know? And so where a lot of people would probably put that effort into the writing, I would rather let the writers of Next Best Picture handle that load, you know, a little bit more so. And I'll pick up the slack on the podcast because at the end of the day, I'm the host of that. And if I'm not running the uh, ship smoothly, then nothing's going to go well for anybody else. So I, I, I felt it was very much more important for me to put more effort into that. Now, I was listening to the Promising Young Woman podcast and uh, Emerald Fennell thanked you at the end for like championing Promising Young Woman. I, I felt like I felt really happy for you because I was like that, that, that like she she realized that you were actually doing that and you've been doing that for the whole year and you have vowed already to do the same exact thing with Mass, which is awesome. Um, yeah. So do you do you think that your sort of independent campaigning and hyping movies up has an impact on their performance like i don't i don't know if there's any way you can measure that even but what do you think i think that the minute i start really believing that myself that's when things will start to get a little strange i'm okay with other people telling me that i'm i'm very okay if a publicist or someone directly involved like really wants to tell me hey listen we really appreciate your support it's helped a lot Great. The minute I start buying into my own shit, that's when I start getting worried. So I'm going to just sit (laughs) here and tell you, I don't believe it's really having that much of an impact. I think a lot of it is luck. And you know what? There are other movies that maybe also deserve that amount of attention. I like to try and not be a cheerleader so much as like a a champion for all types of movies. And so for myself, like I don't want to come across as that guy that's only ever rooting for his favorites. Um, I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known as somebody who was willing to watch everything, didn't just watch one type of thing and was seen as someone that was always honest with how they felt about it, because there's a lot of perceptions of a lot of people out there where they do get that respect uh, and also that um, validation from those types of people that you mentioned before. And it gets to their head. And now all of a sudden, when there's a really objectively shitty movie, that comes out that everybody does not like. And then they're like, oh, five stars. Greatest thing ever. Rah! You know, it's like, mm, come on, buddy. You know, what, what are you hoping? You're hoping they're <laughs> going to pat you on the back again. You know what I mean? Like, d- don't do it for that. Yeah, I think that we should coordinate and, you know, you can get all the next best picture team. We'll we'll do it. We'll we'll pick a movie that has like basically no shot, like. I think you were a fan of Waves, right? So like the next was. No, 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 something that's less than that. Well, or I guess you're saying a semi shot. The next thing that comes across <laughs> that we're fans of, we're going to put it at number 1 in like multiple mm-hmm. categories and see if we can manifest that. I see, and it's funny too because like with Promising Young Woman, I didn't do that. I didn't put Promising Young yeah, Woman like exactly. number 1 in my best picture charts or anything. I was the yeah. I was the one who was saying, "Yo, it's going to be like Carrie Mulligan and just a screenplay." And I was saying that for Ever. But I mm-hmm. also had this stance of if it just gets that, I'll be happy. I'll, it'll be good enough. Uh, because, like I said, at the end of the day, I didn't want to sacrifice integrity and come across as someone that was being unrealistic. People only care about what I have to say if what I have, not even so much if it's what I have to say is correct, but if they just really believe that I'm coming across it in a very um, objective way. I'm listening to all kinds of feedback from what other people are telling me because. Who wants to hear someone who's not receptive to the changing of the tide and also like just what they're hearing from other people and just believes in their own shit? Who who wants to hear that? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think definitely people, you know, they definitely value when they think that you're going at it from an unbiased perspective, when you're not just picking your favorites or like what you want to see happen. I, I think maybe everybody's a little bit susceptible to it. Like I was probably more yeah. doubtful of news of the world after having seen it. Oh, me too. No, and then sometimes I'll let my, you know, hopes get way, way up. Like right now, like the worst thing that could have ever have happened to me was Promise the Young Woman started getting into picture and director categories and things like that. Because now I'm like, yo, if you guys are building me up just so that on Oscar nomination morning, y'all can pull a Gone Girl on me and take all those nominations away. <laughs> like I'm not I'm not here for it. But that's the thing, too. You have that precedent to look back on and you 
you know, you, every year you get a little bit smarter at playing this game, you know, because there are lessons that you learn every year from the defeat. I see you guys sometimes uh, exactly. and your reactions to your videos and you guys are freaking out. And listen, if they're warranted, you know, you guys react the way I'm reacting, like internally. I wish I could react externally <laughs> the way you guys do to some of the shit that you do. But um, uh, but, but those are lessons to learn. And, you know, and it's funny, though, because like <laughs> You guys wouldn't be who you were if you guys uh, didn't learn <laughs> didn't learn your lesson, and then you were predicting these <laughs> snubs because then you guys wouldn't have these awesome reaction videos <laughs> where you guys are surprised. You know what I mean? Getting predictions wrong, like like I don't like it. I don't like being wrong. So it like does. yeah, it does like actually motivate me to be better. But it also motivates me like if I see you know the consensus doing better than me. Like if I see gold derbies like doing better than me, then I think well I got to play it more conservative. So that's like, yeah. you know, there, there are people, and I think that sometimes like on your podcast, you'll, you'll notice the people who are like trying to predict the long shots and you'll notice the people who are, you know, playing it conservative. It's just like, you know, some people have like kind of different strategies about where things go. This was a year, I have to admit, like this year was the first time ever where I felt hmm. like I was really trying to play chess, where everybody else was playing like tic-tac-toe. And I really was trying in a lot of our episodes this year to not just see what the critics groups were doing, but like what is going to happen when we get to the guilds, how are things going to change? And there are some things that, you know, we predicted and then there were things that are still happening that has us going, you know what? we considered it we weren't willing to go all in with it like it was there it was on our radar but like we we weren't ready to go there and that's just the nature of the game you know it's just like it's just you follow it piece by piece you have fun along the way and people like it when you're surprised people like it when you're shocked upset disappointed and you know there are times where i come on to the podcast and i joke around all the time <laughs> saying i'm losing my hair all over again you know and any hair i have left is going gray so you know it's all fun and games in the end, because unlike an actual campaign, like a political campaign in this world, there aren't any lives at stake, you know, or anything like that. So have fun with it. You know, don't take it so seriously. And, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, my friend Josh Parham said this to me the other day, and I really, really liked what he said. He said, no one will care if you get early predictions wrong. No one will care if a contender that you thought was not going to be a contender all of a sudden turns out to be. No one will care if you got your Golden Globe predictions wrong. All they will care about <laughs> is the ending. They will care how you got your damn Oscar winner predictions. And that is it. That is all people will remember. So it all comes down to that. And you know what? If you don't get it right one year, you try again the next year. Yeah, I don't necessarily. I don't even think when I look at like my winner predictions that I'm any that I'm any better than other people are. Oftentimes, I'm I'm sometimes better at nominations, but I think that's just because I don't go nuts. Like I won't I won't like predict like random stuff. I'll, I'll go mostly safe and some outside, and that's kind of how I've been playing. Mm -hmm. But I agree, it's 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 really just more like I don't think it's ever something you can take that seriously. Like that's why it's kind of funny is because reacting to stuff is like don't you know you scream because you it's it's like you're taking it seriously but at the same time like it's also it's also embracing that it's just really fun and like the surprises oh, yeah. are a part of it like if there weren't surprises and if there weren't like getting upset which isn't really getting upset it's kind of just like you know it's like getting just, out of a video game yeah just like flailing around and having fun at, at, at you know so yeah, it is. It is a very yeah. Like, I mean, watching thing. you guys like react to uh, Jodie Foster winning the Golden Globe <laughs> this week, for example, literally, I, I think I told you guys that made my week. It was like the greatest <laughs> thing I'd ever seen. And then when um, was it on your day? I don't remember, but it was another one that happened later that night. Yeah, Andrew, you looked like you short circuited, like you, something broke in your brain, and you were just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like you just couldn't yeah. couldn't breathe for a moment i mean like it was great and i i loved it and you know that's something that for myself um you know I, I i would love to be able to do some sort of a live kind of element so that this way like i could share that with people because um you know for so long uh we just do our podcast the next day the evening of and you know we talk about it but i think people really respond to that raw emotion like that that the <laughs> real real emotion that is something that you can't fake it just like it is organic and when it happens it is freaking awesome <laughs> yeah and it's like i mean when parasite won that's that's oh, something yeah. that i like whenever i think about that 
I feel emotional. Like I, I feel like if I if if I you know put myself back in that time, like I will get like choked up, like because I wanted it to win so bad, and it was the underdog, and it was a great movie, and they're all Korean. They didn't expect to win. Yeah, there's there, there's Bong, some like thanks Martin Scorsese. I cry like every time. Yeah, <laughs> and and yeah, so like watching the re, you know watching the actual awards happen, people getting the award and didn't expect it, or like the audience gasping and like clapping is a huge part of it. So yeah. Yeah, there has to be a combination of, of like, like I feel good when I get things right, but it's also really fun when I when I'm wrong. There are people who like take it a little too seriously or they'll get like genuinely like annoyed at other people's predictions, which is like the least consequential thing you could possibly be annoyed about. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yeah, that's I, I think that it. like you kind of nailed it on your podcast. Like you're trying to like for, for it to be like fun because because in a way it is kind of just like a game and a hobby and like. You know, I also think if you do it enough, you realize like you are not going to be like you, you are going to be less right than you think almost all the time. Yeah. I always you just kind of get used to it. Yep. Like when we started, we were like, you know, we were like younger and like maybe, I don't know, like when, when did we like start getting into this? Maybe high school. You so like with YouTube or just, I don't know, just in general. So I think we were probably more like more confident about stuff or we were like, there was never going to happen. I, I never say that something's never going to happen anymore. Never. Nope. <laughs> Um, nope <laughs> like i can't but back then i would have yeah. I, I i i had so much fun saying like this is never gonna happen they would never do this and like being kind of confident about it and now like nope 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 anything can happen i always uh i, I always warn people whenever they use absolutes you yeah know? exactly like this is definitely happening uh this is definitely not happening i'm like hey <laughs> oh okay <laughs> you know i'm like you want to go there but i mean in all honesty you know, it's like I I agree that there are a lot of people, especially on social media, who I don't know if it's jealousy. I don't know like what it is, but it's almost like the idea of them coming at you for your predictions. It, it, sometimes <laughs> the way it comes across to me is like I, I hate that you are who you are, and I want to be at your level, status, whatever it is. So I'm going to do everything I can to like try and show you that I'm the right one and you're the wrong one. You know what I mean? And it's like this weird thing that happens. Whereas like, you know, for me on our show, I like just having people who treat each other respectfully um, and we engage in a conversation about it. You know, and we try to look at it from all possible angles. We try to look at it from a standpoint of, okay, well, if this person wins the Golden Globe, now if they're going to win the Critics' Choice on Sunday, then they're not going to be nominated for the SAG and the BAFTA. <laughs> now, that means that the person who has to uh, challenge them has to win both SAG and BAFTA, and that's the pathway then for, you know, it's like all this stuff that you just start, like like I said, you just start playing like a game of chess. Yeah. Moves are being made, that's, pieces that's are being fun. taken off the board. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. And you just try to figure out all the possible moves. Queen's Gambit, mm -hmm. that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you gotta you gotta see like diff, uh, different threads, multiple threads going through. Yeah, yeah, three D chess. Um, how many awards? How how long have you been into the Oscars? Like, how many awards seasons have you really been a hobbyist in predicting them? So, first Oscars I remember visually seeing was uh, two thousand and one. Uh, that was uh, the year of a beautiful mind. And then the first Oscars I can remember actually sitting down and watching with my parents was uh, the year of Return of the King. I don't know what happened mm -hmm. in 2002 in between. I, I just, I don't know. Maybe I, <laughs> maybe I walked downstairs and they were watching it. I have no idea. But so Return of the King was a big deal because I was a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Um, I loved those movies uh, growing up and they were, uh, they were for me what Star Wars was for the generation prior. And so that is actually the movie that got me into movies and into like behind the scenes, creative and really just like kind of kickstarted my whole journey. So when Lord of the Rings swept and went 11 for 11, I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. They give awards to my favorite <laughs> movies and like, this is amazing. So I all of a sudden was really obsessed with the Oscars. So the next year, I then all of a, uh, all of a sudden started following like, you know, the broke back uh, crash year. And well, that was a mistake um, because that was obviously a very infamous example of a film that could win everything and make you believe so wholeheartedly that there's no way it could lose and then having your heart broken on Oscar night. 
And then following that, it's like I started then reading awards daily uh, at the time. Uh, Sasha Stone was, um, you know, like one of the very, very few. It, no, I think the like the only female uh, Oscar blogger, actually. And I just really, really liked her writing about the race. And then I started looking at other websites from there. Like I said, I discovered Oscar Igloo, which later became Award Circuit. And um, Chris Tapley was a huge inspiration for me as well. It's so weird because like now I'm like friends with all these people. Um, but like at the time, like I was just a fan and, you know, I became so entrenched in the history that from there on, it's like I've just been watching and watching and watching. But then, like, you know, in terms of NBP coming around, our first season uh, was 2016, Moonlight and La La Land. And that was oh, just... Oh, you guys aren't even that old. Wow. That... Hmm. No, we launched in the fall of 2016. And I was uh, doing my own personal blog for only about a year before that. Uh, like I said, I started doing this a little bit later. <laughs> mm. Wow, yeah. And have you, have you observed that the Oscars have changed, like... As far as even watching them, I mean, it's probably a better question to ask someone who's been a, like, you know, maybe someone a whole generation up. But do you think that the Oscars and um, the movies they nominate are kind of like, I guess the culture around them has changed? Like the type of movie they're willing to nominate? Yeah, kind of like the type of movies. Yeah, totally. I think it's a slow, gradual change. I don't think we're obviously where uh, places like Film Twitter uh, want them to be quite yet. But I do sense that there is always a slow, gradual change. And there's always small pockets of wins every single year. There's always, of course, something where they, you know, do something or another that kind of pushes them back a few years, it feels like, you know, but at the same time, I look at like Mad Max Fury Road and I say to myself, man, like, how the hell did that happen? But yeah. then it's like you think back to something like The Fugitive in 1993, and I feel like I would have had the exact same reaction. Oh, there's no way they're going to go for an action movie like that. You know what I mean? And they did. They yep. absolutely did. So, you know, it's interesting because, like, you think to yourself all the time, like, how much it's supposed to be about the best. It's never about the best. It's more so about finding movies that in a given year with the competition that is there, uh, what can you sit a majority of people in front of that they collectively like the most? Yeah. And it's funny because like from a crowd pleaser standpoint, you then say to yourself, okay, then well, come Knives Out wasn't nominated for Best Picture? That was such a crowd pleaser. You could, yeah, you could sit that in front of that anybody. <laughs> well, guess what? It was very close, you know? So at least mm -hmm. I think it was very close. It was building up a lot of steam yeah, towards so. the end there. So it could have gotten there in the end, but I mean, you know, that would have been one of those uh, a serious man situations where it's just screenplay picture and that's it probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, although I'm going off on a tangent here. I love the editing and the production and the costume design. Of yeah. That movie. But um, yeah, I saw it. Needless again, to I say. Like, that, I feel like this could have gotten campaign and best picture nominated. Like there's, there's almost no difference in a way between that and other nominees, like in terms of how good it is. And yeah, you know, it's very rewatchable. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yep, totally. Genre, but I, I mean, that's another thing, too, is that like once you're in the club, like once you actually break through and you're a part of the Oscar club, that is where repeat nominations and then also us as Oscar predictors were like, OK, we have this on our radar because of its release date, because it's a Quentin Tarantino movie, because it's uh, Greta Gerwig is back with yep. another movie after being nominated for Lady Bird. We have to keep our eye on Little Women now, where as on the flip side of that beforehand, I don't know how many people were ever predicting Lady Bird to be an Oscar movie. You know, maybe once yeah. it got, um, you know, the Telluride. Uh, slot and people were like, oh, Greta Gerwig's got a movie to tell you, right? What is this about? You know? Um, but that's the thing. It's like, once you're in, I guarantee you, whatever Bong Joon-ho does next, everyone is going to put on their early Oscar predictions. Everybody. Because oh, yeah. he's in the club now. You know? Same yep. thing that we're doing with Guillermo del Toro with Nightmare Alley. Everybody's got their eyes on Nightmare Alley to see if they're going to bring Guillermo back because they've already welcomed him. So, that's like an that's like from an Oscar predicting standpoint and just trying to figure out what's going to be a best picture movie, what's not going to be. A lot of it is bringing people back. And I know yep. people get a little annoyed by that because then you have newcomers that make truly some of the best movies of the year. And it's like they don't have a shot in hell or if they're considered a long shot on the bubble like Minari was for a long time. But sometimes with the right campaign and if you have like a long enough time for a movie to get seen by a lot of people and the momentum is able to just build gradually over time like as minari has 
passion will carry you through. And I really do believe that's a movie, for example, that, um, you know, we're just seeing this overwhelming sense of emotion and uh, adoration for this movie that I think is going to push it uh, to, I think it's going to push it all the way. I think it's going to get um, a lot of nominations at this point. Yeah. I think back to Linklater and how, in the coming years, people thought like every movie that he did was going to be an Oscar contender and he hasn't really even been like close. But that's always like no. the cycle. It's like, at you know, in the beginning of the year, Spielberg and Scorsese and everyone like they're number one and two. And then like, you know, half of those like huge director movies drop out. And then there's a bunch of stuff that nobody ever sees coming, like Promising Young Woman or something. And that, those are always like the fun yep, ones. Exactly. That is a great, that, that's like the strategy I use though. I mean, I have my list for, I have my list of, it, it used to be next year's Oscar contenders, but now it's just future Oscar contenders. And whatever mm -hmm. project Jordan Peele does next, whatever project Emerald Fennell does next, or Greta Gerwig, like that goes on there. Yeah, and then you have like Sundance, which helps you to kind of predict like, um, okay, what are some of these newcomers that are going to be in these year-end uh, critics awards and might get that needed boost to then contend for the awards and be that outside-the-bubble contender that pushes its way in. And that's how I feel about movies like Mass, for example, this year, where, um, you know, first-time director and none of these uh, actors uh, in this film have been nominated uh, before. And so, you know, is it going to be a vehicle for Ann Dow to get like a Best Supporting Actress Oscar? I, I hope so. We'll see what happens, you know. I think. <laughs> and if, if anything from Sundance this year gets Best Picture nominated, is it Mass? So funny story really quick about that. Uh, my answer is that I think Mass is very much like The Father. Mm -hmm. Okay, acting, writing, directorial debut, pretty flashy at times, right? Uh, but also very emotionally powerful and very overwhelming. And it's it's a, it's quite an experience watching it. I, you guys know, you guys saw it, right? Yeah. yeah really. I saw yeah. Mass, not the father, but he saw the father. Okay. He's still waiting. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're still, I, I think they're very comparable in, in a couple of different ways in that regard. Because they're also very small, intimate movies, too. Yeah. Um, so, but there's one other movie called Flea, which Neon mm. picked up this year. And I watched this thing and I thought to myself, wow, that could be an international feature contender if it gets selected by uh, the country. Um, it could be a documentary contender. It could be an animated film contender. Hypothetically, if it got all three of those nominations, I'm just spitballing here. How far off is Best Picture at that point? <laughs> Yeah, that that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. It gets nominated for more um, best film awards than anything has ever done. But then the only I thing is like the, the package is lacking. I mean, it's probably lacking like a screenplay. It's lacking actors. You know, so I guess you could. But, say, but like, think about this: if they it's got all those other in. things. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, that would be that, pretty that, cool. That's that funny. The happened. package isn't like any technicals. It's just the fact that it's all of these. It's in all these categories. Yeah. You could argue for that. All that's these one individual that's, best film categories. You know, if there's any yeah, film that's guaranteed them. an Oscar nomination from Sundance, it's Flea. Like guaranteed yeah, somewhere, it has to be. I mean, again, I I would go mm -hmm. you know ninety nine because we can't do absolutes. Um, what's a film? No. <laughs> what's like the? I guess maybe like, what's a film that you saw and you said you you didn't think about it for Oscars for a second. And at the end of the year, it gets nominated because I felt that way about Get Out. Oh, I, I did not yeah. think that that was an Oscar movie. Um, then people started talking about screenplay and then people started talking about. Yeah, other things it it kind of snowballed the from there. Yeah, I'm on the record for this uh, because I have the podcast review to prove that um, Get Out was one of them for me as well. Saw it in February, thought it was I really thought it was of february just horror release there's so many all the time and you know you don't think of anything of it you know it's like think of all these great horror movies that we see every year like his house this year relic possessor you know how many of those were able to break through and be oscar movies and everyone will say well get out was different okay yes i will admit get out is different get out screenplay is really really good but it was also the box office that film it was the fact that it got people talking those other movies I mentioned didn't do that this year. And I don't think even in a normal non COVID year, they would have done that either. So get out really was 
special and unique and it did exceed my expectations in that way i do vividly remember when we got to uh precursors at the end of the year and i remember um my my uh my friend will mavity saying to me man i think daniel kaluuya is going to be like in the best actor conversation and i was like really like you think so <laughs> yeah and he was like yeah no he's like he does that thing with his eyes and the tears and everything he's like dude actors are gonna love that and he was 100 percent right and i just like i couldn't see it because i thought for sure that it had been forgotten about and um there were all these other big contenders coming but also too, remember you know it's like contenders rise and fall all the time and there really is a great movie from earlier in the year like a truly great movie that can then have the campaign, the momentum, the buzz, the box office. Like all of these things have to fall into place for that movie to kind of rise up. And, you know, I know everybody will say like on an objective quality standpoint, they would hope for movies like Never Rarely Sometimes or First Cow uh, from this year. Like you think about the first half of the year. Um, Defy Bloods is another one. But unfortunately, um, I, 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 it feels to me like this year. Anything that was not a festival movie released before September um, is being left out to pasture this year. It just feels like, you know, um, I don't know why it's happening that way. I, maybe voters' mindsets are just so short this year. Uh, we've heard reports that people are very apathetic towards, you know, the movie year in general. They weren't like us where during the first months of quarantine, we were just trying to watch everything we possibly could because theaters were shut down. Um it's been a very weird year in that regard. And, you know, it's like, once again, I may watch 200 new movies a year. It doesn't mean Academy voters do that. You know, I'm wired a certain way, as I mentioned before. So um, if an Academy voter is only going to watch, say, 20 movies or less a year, they're probably going to watch the big buzzed about films that have these massive awards campaigns and have those big names attached to them. So it becomes really, really tough for a film released that early to like I said, maintain that level of buzz and momentum to become one of those top 20 films that somebody checks out when we get to the screener process. Mm -hmm. How do mm -hmm. you think the critics' circles affect the Oscar race? Or to what extent do they affect that? Because something like Get Out, like, was that boosted by critics' circles? Like, are they the ones who really brought people onto that? Like, as I say all the time, critics are not Oscar voters. And, you know, it's like people always seem to forget that all the time. What the critics do is they help to narrow down the field. They really do help with, OK, we have hundreds of movies that came out this year. And as a critic, it's your job to watch as many as humanly possible. So if you're whittling that down to a best picture lineup of 10 or five in a group of, you know, actor, director, whatever it is you're helping people to kind of whittle down, uh, you know, the, the race, if you will. So, you know, think about this when you guys are doing your Oscar predictions and you first start off at the beginning of the season, and let's say it's like June, it's like the halfway mark. Uh, you pretty much are putting together your lists and you might have, say, 20 movies or something like that. And then it starts to get whittled down maybe just a little bit. And then it also expands and like things come out during the festivals and some stuff bombs. There's like unexpected things that happen. So it just starts to become more fluid, right? Sometimes that list will expand to like 30 or something. And you're like, wow, there's so many good movies. I don't know how they're going to sift through all of this and try to figure all this out. But then the critics awards start chiming in and then a consensus starts to form. And group think starts to take over that's like one of the things that like for me personally I, I got like kind of annoyed with this year in particular uh was you know yeah all right fine like sasha baron cohen i know he's had a great year with Bora and he's had a great campaign and everybody seems to really love him and everything but we really couldn't get one critics group anywhere to vote for someone else from trial you all just had to like <laughs> fall in line like this you know and it's just like it's a little yeah. odd to me that um you can have that much of a consensus, but hey, you know what? Maybe that is the truth sometimes. Maybe the consensus really is the consensus and everybody just truly thinks that there is a top five and then there's just everybody else. Um, but that does annoy me sometimes because I like it when there's fluidity and I like it when it's unpredictable and there's surprises and people just randomly pop up and you're like, oh shit, is, it, is this, does this mean something? I don't know, you know? Um, yeah. Once again, 
Jodie Foster winning the globe. And <laughs> oh God, I don't remember which one of you that said it, but you guys, you were like, this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think critics groups help to narrow things down. They don't help to actually tell us what's going to win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got and, it. Yeah, and, that makes and, sense. and the critics groups they, they became so they became dull after like three weeks this year. And then I was thinking, why would you be a critics group and be like a month and a half into critics groups nominations? Because at that point, people aren't interested anymore because they know you're just gonna like you know nominate the usual favorites. Like, and, and some of it I get. Like, I I get Chloe Zhao winning everywhere, but you know, mm-hmm. it became a little boring after a while seeing them give the same awards to like every movie. Um. And well, that's uh, something you run into like all the time, right? Um, I will never forget the year of the artists and where the artists just yeah. steamrolled the entire year <laughs> and how I looked back on that. And I was just like, oh, man, this is so boring because then you're right. It is a slog because all of a sudden now, if everybody is falling in line and saying this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. Well, and where's the race? It's not fun. You know, we'll watch the Oscars for the pomp and circumstance and, you know, we'll have like fun with the speeches and everything, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, in terms of what's winning, if it's a uh, done, signed, signed and uh, sealed, delivered, you know, winner, nobody really wants that. You know, they want to see La La Land versus Moonlight live on pay-per-view going head to head. You know, they want to see that. Uh, they don't want to see, you know, uh, I mean, hell, even Parasite last year, the critics gave parasite everything last year and it started to even feel like as much of a beloved movie that was by the time it got around to like over 25 critics wins i remember people commenting on some of the uh regional critics wins and being like oh same winners different day you know like and it's like yo you guys are getting bored over parasite winning shit this is not good (laughs) and then all of a sudden in comes the golden globes and the guilds and bafta to say 1917 versus parasite live on (laughs) pay-per-view And it's like we had our Oscar showdown and that made it so much more fun, didn't it? Not knowing if it was going to be 1917 or Parasite heading into the night. Uh, whereas if we all head into Oscar night and we're all saying, oh, Nomadland won the PGA, Nomadland won the BAFTA, won the Globe, won Critics' Choice, Nomad- Nomadland, Nomadland, Nomadland. Like, where's the fun going to be? Yeah, I remember like the first years that we were into the Oscar. I think we got into the Oscars sort of like sort of around the, the year of the Hurt Locker. And then we had, um, like, King's Speech was unpredictable, but then it was The Artist, it was Argo, and it's 12 Years a Slave. And I, like, thought that I was learning that, like, the movie that wins just sweeps everywhere, and that's how it is. But then, like, you know, mm-hmm. like, like, since then, the movie that won the BAFTA never won Best Picture. So, like, since then, it's actually been really unpredictable. And in some ways, it helps to be, like, just a little bit behind. Like, you know, Moonlight was, like, kind of mm-hmm. crouching there waiting, and... You know, Parasite wasn't behind until the other awards put it behind. And then we were like, why don't we get it out there? But yeah, Nomadland this yeah. year is just like, if I, I don't know what how like, I, I feel like that that definitely has a chance to to do a clean sleep, sweep unless the PGA decides to do something. I mean, so my current theory is Nomadland is going to win at Critics' Choice this Sunday. Mm-hmm. Nomadland is going to win uh, the BAFTA. Nomadland will win the DGA. I have a feeling that Trial of the Chicago 7 will win the WGA, the PGA, and the SAG. And that is where we're going to have like this really intense, uh, hopeful, I, I, I'm hopeful it'll be like an intense showdown between the two then. Because if Nomadland wins the PGA, um, I think it's over at that yeah. point. Oh, yeah. Because it, it's in, it, it, it's even further than... Um, uh, than La La Land was because at least Moonlight won the globe, you know. Um, I don't know. It, it's like, and I got and I get it. Nomad Land and Trial were not in separate categories like La La Land and Moonlight La, Moonlight were, but like at the same time, I just yeah. I mean, but hey, listen, Nomad Land's a great movie, so you know it'll be a Best Picture winner that everyone will be happy with, and we'll all be fine, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Whereas to me, it's like I look at like Trial and I say to myself, this is Argo. You know, this is a nice uh, studio film that you can show to anybody and anybody will like it. It's got some level of importance to it, but it's not like overly serious in terms of that, you know, or anything. Uh, You know, it's not high art, but whatever, you know, it's like the Oscars rarely go for what would be considered the objective best. Like 
Roma is going to be teached in schools like 50 years from now. You know, there'll be film courses about Roma alongside Igmar Bergman and, uh, you know, Fellini and and things like that, you know. (laughs) But then there's Green Book. (laughs) So, you know, I mean, it's like King Speech Social Network, right? Which one has endeared as the movie that everybody still loves to this day, you know, over a decade later? Mm -hmm. Uh, But hey, you know. It's all funny. It's all fine. It'll be a number mm. one next year. I, I think I've, I've sort of saw Trial of Chicago 7 as Argo like you did, and I've been predicting it to do that for a while, and the Golden Globes were like, you know, kind of upset that. Yeah, I, li- I like the prediction, though. WGA, SAG, PGA. Um, I'm Still excited to see if it. It, it will be a two-horse race. That's a Birdman sweep, isn't it? Right, yeah. right. It could Birdman it. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think we'll have that's to do what, another That's what Birdman did, video. exactly. I want a speed round from you. Who's winning supporting actress and who was winning best actress? Go. <laughs> okay, supporting actress right now. Uh, I just switched my prediction yesterday to Yu Yun Jung for Minari. All right. And you're banking on Critics' Choice for that one, um, I'm guessing? So I Sad, see absolutely no reason why Glenn Close lost the Golden Globe. I, 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 As everyone knows, I was thinking this was going to be Glenn Close's year and it was going to be one of those, oh, we're rewarding her for this. Like <laughs> I, I thought that that was the way things were going to go. Uh, but in order for that to have happened, I really felt, felt like she needed to win the Globe because I really don't think she's going to win Critics' Choice. I don't. Yeah. Um, now her hope lies with BAFTA and SAG, which is still possible. But I look at the fact that Minari has those three nominations at SAG, which is better than any of us expected. Mm -hmm. So I have to believe that means something. And I just get the sense that Minari is just, like I said, rising right now. And I think that I I don't think it's going to win picture. I don't think it's going to win screenplay. But I could see that passion rising enough to result in a a win for Yu and Jung. And I think she does stand a good chance to win Critics' Choice and SAG as a result of that. Yeah. I think close, if if I'm really going to still stick with my Glenn Close prediction here, um, there, it's possible that BAFTA decides to make up for not giving it to her for the wife previously, and they give it to her this time for Hillbilly. But they might go another way altogether, you know? So mm-hmm. uh, bottom line is she did win the Globe, and now I'm starting to, you know, I'm, I'm moving off of that prediction. It was funny because like yeah. a week ago, I remember everyone was like, it's Glenn Close all the way, guys. That's <laughs> it. And now it couldn't be it couldn't yep. be less. It couldn't be more up in the air. I still have no idea who I'm going to. And then and then it's actress, so uncertain. We need your actress take really quick. OK. <laughs> all right. Uh, as of today, it's Carrie Mulligan uh, because not because it's my favorite film of the year, not because I really, really want to see her win for it. It's because I really do believe she's going to win BAFTA. That's number one. Number two is SAG is a little up in the air. I will fully admit to that. Like they could give it to Francis again. That would be very weird if they did, because they don't really like to do repeat winners unless if it really is going to be the Oscar winner, which, you know, Francis has exceeded my expectations this year in terms of critics wins. Maybe she really is a coattail win for Nomadland and the passion for that movie. Um, if she wins at SAG, I will see that as SAG voters wanting to still give Nomadland a win somewhere. And that's when that's let me tell you, if Francis wins SAG, that's how you know Nomadland is winning Best Picture at that point. <laughs> um, but if it's not her, then Carrie Mulligan's the only other one in that lineup that makes the most sense to me. I know people are advocating for Viola a lot, and I totally understand that. But my problem with Viola in that category is that there's just been all this rumbling about lack of screen time. It's really Chadwick Boseman's movie. We know he's a lock. Are they going to do a double win for that? It looked like that, that, that it could go that way early in the season. But there's something about the fact that Mulligan's been doing this now for, you know, well over uh, 10 years at this point. She previously had her last nomination for an education in 2009, the Hurt Locker year, as you said before. Um, it, it feels like the right role, the right film, the right time for them to just give her the win now. Uh, Viola's already got a win. Francis already has a win. So that leaves Andre Day. And I really do believe if Andre Day wins the Critics' Choice this Sunday, as I think... Let me tell you something. I, I, I talked to a lot of Critics' Choice members, and they were all picking Mulligan. 
<laughs> there's something in my bones that tells me that since Golden Globes, there's a lot of people that automatically switch to day immediately. Um, <laughs> I just feel that there's a bandwagon mentality and maybe people were looking for an excuse not to pick Mulligan or somebody else. I don't know. But I can tell you this right now. There is definitely a world where Andre Day also wins Critics' Choice. And then she's got Globe Critics Choice, and she's not nominated to SAG. She won't be nominated at BAFTA. She's not long listed. And if Mulligan wins both of those, then it's going to come down to yeah. Mulligan. Does she have the Best Picture nomination? We know that United States versus Billie Holiday won't have a Best Picture nomination. But will Andre Day have something greater? Will she have the narrative of possibly becoming only the second Black actress to win Best Actress? And will that be enough to convince voters? to want to vote for her over mulligan it's a really 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 interesting uh premise if we if we get to that point um mm -hmm. i'll be very very curious to see how it all shakes out so did you say did you just say that people were had carrie mulligan on their ballot at critics choice people you've talked to and now that they see andrew day is actually possibly winning they switch to her i no one has said that i want to be very clear no one has actually sure. said that um, what I can tell you is that there has been a precedent in history of the Globes going with unexpected winners and then Critics' Choice following suit when we thought they were previously going to go with someone else. Okay, like, great example. You guys remember when Willem Dafoe and Laurie Metcalf swept supporting actor and supporting actress across all the Critics groups and were yep. widely predicted to go all to the way mind. to the Oscars? Globes went for them first. Critics' Choice was a week later, and we were all like, oh, Critics' Choice are going to go for Defoe and Laurie Metcalf. And what happened? They went for Rockwell and Janney, and it was like, yep. what? You know? <laughs> yeah. So it would not surprise me. It would not surprise me at all if. Hmm. There's also that's another thing, too. There's a, like no CCA voters have actually voted yet. Uh, hmm. The ballots have not been cast. So this is all like allowed for Andre Day to just like kind of have this late surging momentum, which could propel her to the win now, especially after the film premiered on Hulu. But before the Golden Globe win, um, I don't think anybody, as far as I know from who I've talked to, was picking her. I think um, I, I polled and surveyed like like twenty people. Um, and it was very, very heavily mulligan, like super heavy. Uh, and Andre Day had like two people or something like that that were going for her. Um, you know, but like I said, a small group <laughs> that I'm talking to. Uh, mm -hmm. The Critics' Choice group is a very, very large organization. And at the end of the day, too, Critics' Choice are not Oscar voters either. All they do is they provide a platform for them to give a speech and for Oscar voters to possibly see that speech and go, oh, I like that person. I want to vote for that person. And, you know, that's how we're going to get our nominations in a couple of days after that. It is true. Like, even though it seems so crazy, we, we, you, you can't necessarily dismiss a Golden Globe winner. Golden Globes have uh, correctly given us the best actress winner since 2002. Uh, Kate Winslet uh, being a weird uh, asterisk because she won supporting actress that year and lead for Revolutionary Road. But otherwise, Golden Globes in the comedy or drama, the Oscar winner has emerged from that category since 2002. Hmm. It's a Pike and Day showdown, then. <laughs> <laughs> Does Pike have a shot at a nomination? No, I was talking about this with somebody the other day because I said to myself, you know what, if she was uh, long listed at BAFTA, I would so, so, so predict her to get at BAFTA at this point, but mm -hmm. she's not. So, yeah, my gut says no. My gut says that that mm -hmm. was a really, really cool moment for her, and that was an awesome... Uh, you know, win because I really like her in that movie. And also I love her as an actress. And I think she's owed one after Gone Girl, especially. But they also gave her a nomination for a private war. So clearly the HFPA love her. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you this, that really killed Bakalova. That that mm. hurt so bad. Uh, the only way now that she possibly, in my opinion, stands a chance now at even getting nominated is if she wins Critics' Choice, gives a speech, and is so likable that everybody wants to vote for her. Uh, but if she doesn't have that moment, um, yeah, I, I worry for Bakalova because I just think that that kind of a you know comedic performance is something that very highbrow members of the Academy look at and they just go, oh, 
no, it's like like it's like that pompous like i'm above that i'm not voting for that that's like yeah. gross out humor and what have you i've always kind of thought that bakalova was going to be like the lupita she wins all the critic awards and then doesn't get in because it's a genre performance but if she got into bafta that would that would be the complete package and i might have to reconsider but and then there's Jodie Foster and I, Ellen Burstyn and Helena Zanglitz. I think she's going to be like Jennifer Lopez and Hustlers. I think she'll miss BAFTA. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I, I was going. I think that's going to be the sign like, to everybody. Yeah. And then the only thing with Andre Day that's like, the only time that you win off like the lone nomination for your movie for that, that, that people don't like that much is like usually if you are like a huge veteran actor like Renee Zellweger or, you know, Meryl Streep. And even those movies probably had better reception. It would, I mean, it could happen. Like we can't mm-hmm. underestimate the win, but oh man, I mean, I could, I might be in denial for a while about that. I mean, unless she wins Critics' Choice, then I mean, there's been a fifth slot open in Actress for a very long time. So I mean, it only makes perfect sense for Andre Day to slide in there. The the thing that would be really shocking now is if one of the other four misses. Do you think mm-hmm. McDormand can win? <sighs> I, I've been I've been really against this idea because I personally I don't like second wins. Uh and this mm. would be a third win. I like it when they give it to someone who's never won before. Um Do I think that she could win? Yeah, I think she could win because at the end of the day, she is tied to the best picture front runner. So you can't mm-hmm. underestimate that, you know? But at the same time, God, a third win. Like, she would have to be, like, considered undeniable for that to happen. And I feel like the competition is too stiff this year. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard one. I'll tell you this. Mulligan's hopes <laughs> all depend on if she gets a Best Picture nomination. That's, like, the biggest thing. Oh, yeah. I think I think Promising Young yeah. Woman's got to have it at this point with the director nominations it's getting. That would be shocking <sighs> if it didn't. You're a little worried. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> be careful. I say that because, like, you know... I, I, I like I said, I think back to a movie I keep equating this to is like uh, like I, well, I equate it to a couple of different things, but like Gone Girl is something that comes to mind. And that got uh, Globe nominations for Venture and Director. It got the Critics' Choice nominations. Gillian Flynn looked like such a sure thing for adapted screenplay to win that year. Rosamund Pike was able to survive and make it all the way in the end, but everything else did not. And then the other theory that I've had about Promised Young Woman is uh, it's Nightcrawler. Uh, same year, different movie, mm-hmm. another scenario where right. uh, first time director and Jake Gyllenhaal literally got in everywhere. He got it at CCA, SAG, BAFTA, Globe. Um, he never won any of those awards. And so far, Mulligan is also following that trajectory. She hasn't won yet. <laughs> um, but God, that that movie only got the screenplay nomination in the end. And like I could so easily see a world where Promise Young Woman gets a lone screenplay nomination. And oh man. I think the reason That'd why so I keep upsetting. comparing it to Gone Girl is because what they did to Gone Girl was just so sexist, in my opinion, and just like so just terrible because of the themes of that movie. And it just felt like people were so threatened by it. I mean mm. I didn't even it's clear that, that kind of a mentality still exists with like, I care a lot. You see how like a lot of men responded to that movie when they have a female uh, character that's written in that sort of way. So like with Promise Young Woman, I would not be surprised if um, there was a contingent within the Academy that still felt like, you know, very biased towards that kind of a movie. However, yeah, it's been bit. how many years since then? It's been six years. So you want to think that with the uh, diversity and the membership changes within the Academy, that we're not going to repeat the same mistake and promise a young woman will, uh, you know, picture actress screenplay at a minimum, maybe director. God, I would love it if it got editing. It's probably going to win the ACE for editing. Maybe that would be sick if it got that. And uh, I think like the mwah, chef's kiss would be if it got in for costumes because contemporary costumes mm-hmm. never get nominated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like, the the nightcrawler thing has been surpassed by getting like an extremely strong golden globes and critics choice package with like director and picture but like you know if it yeah. misses like some i agree some dga or pga that's worrisome and and, and also it, you know seeing the the long list turn out at bafta you'd have to think that it's also going to get a really strong showing there so i mean i guess there, there's a fear there i guess but i don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm too confident on it and i'm going to be shocked 
I think it is one of the most passionate movies of the year. Yeah. You know, myself included, a few others. Like, we're really passionate about it. Like, it is a clear number one movie. And that's what you need in this day and age with Best Picture is you got to have that number one passionate support. If you're at all a little middling or you have a screener issue, like The Father, where a lot of people still haven't seen your movie, that's a problem. Um, and then you have stuff like Defy Bloods, which, you know, I'm sure a lot of people think it's a good movie and have it in their tent somewhere. I don't see a lot of people having it at number one, especially when we got to like year end and like people were, I, I always look at people's year end top 10 lists and I always look to see what people have uh, listed for those. And not a lot of people had it for Defy Bloods. So it makes me wonder like, okay, like, is this not going to make it all the way into the best picture race? And the answer looks like it's. To be honest with you, it looks like Defy Bloods is going to get shut out, if I'm being completely honest at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, I've been sort of thinking. <laughs> but who's who has News of the World at number one? That's my question. Who's putting <laughs> News of the World at number one? <laughs> like, who's, I don't, you know, <laughs> where are those people? We don't, we don't know them. We just don't know them. They're just not on Twitter. They're not. You might know them. I've seen a couple of them floating around. That's my question. They're steak I don't eaters. Know if an answer. They are um, <laughs> old school members of the academy. They're they're people who like dad movies. Uh, yeah. This is a big studio western starring Tom Hanks. You know, this is a movie I could show my grandfather and my father. Uh, and there are a lot of people still out there who like that sort of thing. There's also um, this idea within the academy of we don't want to just nominate all streaming and indie movies. We want to have a big studio movie of some sort. And the pickings for that are very, very slim this year. News of the world fits the bill. I like yeah. I hate to say it because like I rallied against it myself because when <laughs> I saw it, I was like, it's good. It's not great. And it's kind of messy in some points. Like, I don't understand why this is so like why people are going crazy over this. Um, you know, I see it as Ford V Ferrari. I think it's going to get like the crafts and picture. I see people predicting it for adapted screenplay and Helena Zengel and stuff like that. And I'm like, listen, I, I, I'm not writing it off. I see it. I, I see the writings on the wall there, but I have to believe there are a lot of people that feel the same way that you and I feel about it, where it's like, it ain't get it. It, it can't get like eight or nine nominations. Can it, <laughs> you know, that will be crazy. Yeah. I mean, if it, it feels like a PGA, five nomination then, movie. Yeah, right. if it misses PGA, I might be like, not anymore. Because just getting Critics' Choice. Oh is no, not no, great. I think it's gonna get. I think it's gonna get PGA. No, no, I'm Believe saying me, if it I misses, it PGA. won't. But I am predicting it to get PGA. Yeah. Um. The the other yeah. thing is, it's like I don't know if you know any more about this, but like, what is the deal with the fathers? Like, you know, lack of screeners. Like, why would they choose to release their movie in such a way where? People can't see it until like mid March, and you know they're not making it readily available. They're not think considering streaming. They're not. I don't know. Like, what is that? Is it's just? It just seems like an obviously we, bad move. We talked about learning lessons earlier, right? And Judas. Y'all remember Judas. Sony Pictures classics? How they handled uh, "Call Me by Your Name" in 2017. I wasn't. I, I never paid that, that much movie, attention to uh, that like, stuff until recently. So it got a limited release. But then the actual release for the general public was like well into uh, the following year of 2018. And it was like oh. um, so it was like so late until people were actually able to see it. Now, Call Me By Your Name had a lot of passion that year, a lot of number one passionate support. Um, so it was able to kind of, you know, get the necessary nominations that it did. But there's. You know, there's a world where that movie does so much better. It gets in for director. It gets in for someone in supporting actor. Yeah. Cinematography. Some, some guy. Uh, it gets in for, yeah, cinematography. But <laughs> Father, it's like I look at that movie and I'm like, God damn, you guys could have had picture, director, editing, production design, actor, supporting actress, and uh, screenplay all on the editing. table. But now... Yeah, yeah, now we're looking at just actor and supporting actress at this point, maybe screenplay. So you don't you have it all for picture. Yeah, well, so because for the longest time, <laughs> for the longest time, I thought the father was going to be like Foxcatcher. I thought it was going to oh, get yeah. in for um, editing, screenplay, acting. And I thought Florian Zeller was going to surprise and be like that director of that. Because to be honest, like you guys seen this, the director's branch sometimes will throw us like a Paul Thomas Anderson, a Paul Pawlikowski yeah. or something just really like um, art housed European sensibility, like kind of just something that they really, really respect on a craft level. You know, it's like 
they'll go very Artur based. Um, and it just seemed to me like Florian Zeller was like fitting the bill for that. So I was thinking, man, there's a world where this Fox catchers itself and it gets like all these nominations, but then misses picture. I mean, that oh. first time DGA list this year is going to be kick ass. I can't wait to see who makes that lineup. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'll be good. Some people there, there's whisperings of, oh, oh Paul Greengrass is going to get that. So I'm mm. really hoping I don't see that on the DGA <sighs> list. Yeah, but I need. A, I, I, hope I was we like, do. okay, look, because I will if we take do, that, that means he's not getting the Oscar nomination. Yeah. Oh, if he does, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he will be a very, very easy. Hey, he got DGA. Let's knock him off yeah, that's, DGA that's, and let's that's put somebody else in right. for Oscar. <laughs> yep. This has been a fun and exciting conversation with Matt Neglia, and we're we're so thankful that he would he would come on and talk to us for all of you to see. You can find links to the Next Spec Fisher podcast and website in the description. And I'm actually a patron of Next Spec Fisher. So if you want to also become a patron on Patreon, uh, we're going to leave that in the description as well. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Do you think this Oscar race is going to be Glenn Close?